Hello, hello. Everybody has been fed? You all found a sandwich? Yes, yes? great. So we'll go on in, in English, just because I need some practice sometimes. But uh, if you can't uh, hear me or understand me, there's a very good translation system. Thank you. So I think that the session A this afternoon will very much go on on what was said this morning by the main sessions. And uh, we will cover most aspects that don't fit in inclusion or in uh, the session C, the transferable skills. So we'll deal with uh, practical issues like uh, what works, what doesn't work, what uh, should we do based on what has been achieved in uh, whatever country. But you will see sometimes also other topics. Uh, you will see that, uh, for instance, we mentioned, uh, although they were not strictly on the program this morning, unwritten rules like what's in it for me, commercial interest, what makes people adopt new approaches or not? Why does ICT make it in some areas and in some others not? We'll try to reach uh, some point where we can open a few doors, uh, get rid of a few misunderstandings or prejudices sometimes, so that we can work fast and forward. So, just to sort out the doubts, you know that we've had some 30 years now of ICT projects. And uh, very recently, two years ago, PISA, you all know about PISA, uh, have found that uh, any country that had invested heavily on ICT could not show any results for it. No improvement. They were not particularly well placed in the PISA uh, cattle. Uh, so it shows that maybe we are missing somewhere something. You also know that uh, Steve Jobs and many ICT CEOs from the Silicon Valley have insisted on putting their children in not connected schools and are very careful about the time their children spend in front of their screens. So that raises a few questions as well. When everybody tells us, go for ICT, push, uh, that's the way forward, we must, uh, if you got ICT, we'll have a free world and democracy and we'll all be fed properly and the uh, well-being will be forever. Uh, many people have some doubts about that. So, in the end, we find that maybe we should not take this in a binary way, sorry for the ICT specialist, it's not yes or no, good or bad, but it's a bit like a walk. The, the world is a bit like a walk. If you introduce one good ingredient in your walk, the walk will get better. If you introduce a poor ingredient in your walk, the walk will get worse. You can see that ICT is a bit like a car. If you just miss a few bits, it won't work lose the key of the car, and the car is not much use. Like with the car, drivers must also know where they're heading. What are the goals? What do we want to achieve in terms of education? What is a good school? We must also know as a driver what are the ways to the destination, and it would be handy to be able to drive the car itself. So, we have an, probably a problem in that there are so many issues at stake that it's difficult to have the time to address them all in one go. And if you take them separately, uh, you could discuss forever on using or not using ICT, but it won't lead you anywhere. So, but yet, we are here because we believe that something can be achieved, and uh, we'll see that uh, it's not ICT as an end in itself, that is the, the goal, but it's just a powerful tool to an end. The prevailing success factors are those who are never discussed. I mean, what have we see, said this morning about objectives? Quickly, good education, quality for all, that's it. Okay, is that concrete? Do we have all the same view about what is quality education for all? If I ask any of you, I will probably have as many different answers as I've got people in front of me. So, only smart goals work. Smart, oh, that comes from economy, that comes from uh, neoliberalism, uh, we don't want that. Okay, but if these things are about the community, these goals are as important or even more important than any private business goals. So, smart as for specific. Quality education for all, not convinced that that's enough. It should be really specific. Measurable, of course. Ambitious. 
linked to a real responsibility. I'm still surprised to see in 2017 that the word accountability does not exist in French, <laughs> except in a long-winded sentence. And over time, I mean, it's not for, you know, the big evening. No, it's for next June or for 2018. Unless we have these goals, unless these are ingrained in our culture, we won't make much progress. And they must be shared, of course. If we are all running after different uh, goals, uh, it will be less effective. So what would be a vision that could make it work? What could be a shared vision if we are all different? Well, if we go upstream enough, maybe we'll find a few elements on which we can agree. If you look at a child being born today, how long will he live? Unless we blow out the planet in the next few years, which is always possible, they will probably live 100 years. Okay? So we should provide them, through our education, something at school that makes him happy for 100 years. Happy, free, independent, healthy, and contributing to the community. Why not? For his, for his whole life. So what do I need, what do you need to teach him to make him happy until 2117? I don't have the faintest idea. Things that are considered essential in your curriculums these days could be completely obsolete in two years' time. We've seen in many... Uh, higher education programs that what they learned in the first year was no longer applicable when they got the degree. So how do we manage that? How do we manage to be uh, always uh, applicable even over 100 years? It's probably by transferring our focus on knowledge and competencies to capabilities. Knowledge and competencies can be quickly obsolete. But through them, you can build up capabilities. If you f find a soldier from the Roman times who knows everything about horses and carts, if he's clever, if he's got a good emotional intelligence, if he's good socially, if he's good technologically in a wider context, manually, if he's got some artistic talent, if he's got some critical sense and he's cre creative, he probably won't be lost for long he will find his way very quickly, because capabilities are more or less forever. It's difficult to just train for capabilities, but generally speaking, if we have a view on global capabilities, through content, through knowledge, through competencies, we can build up those capabilities to make him survivable <laughs> for 100 years. What do we have in that respect today? We have uh, PISA, which seems to be a standard. PISA, great, 65 countries, uh, well-established external evaluation system or assessment system, that's very good. But unfortunately, it's purely on the intellectual side, not much for the other sides. Okay, we could maybe develop this to go further on the other uh, dimensions. It should be maybe more than every three years, and it should be more maybe than just at 15 years of age. But then it could be applicable everywhere, and that's probably more specifically directed towards those capabilities we should try and build and which should bring us together, maybe. You see, I think that if we go upstream enough, we can agree on these things. The child being born 100 years, what does he need? Nothing too sensational. Who could object? Maybe 1% of the people wouldn't like too many people to be too well educated, but that leaves 99%. So, let's go. Now, we've seen that uh, there are limits to the progress achieved by ICT. But ICT on its own is not enough. We've seen that the philosophy, the vision, is not enough either. But both can help each other. And that's what we've got to, to make work. And it's difficult, it's been difficult, but we're getting there. We've had some very encouraging presentations this morning showing what could be achieved. If you look at those new approaches, like blended learning, search mode, learning by searching for solutions, the anti approach, whereby you give questions and answers before the exams, for a few days, a few weeks, and say that uh, uh, some of those questions will be at the exam, you change completely the psychological dynamic of the system. 
the student, the pupil, knows that the teacher is not after him, but is helping him. That changes the whole thing. And you give the answers. In classic schools, you don't give answers. You just teach, and you suppose that everything, everything's been clear and well uh, studied. But just giving the exact answers is completely different sometimes from what the students believe the, the real answer is. Nano-learning, whereby you learn for a minute uh, going into a, a metro station or whatever. Solidarity, not judging just the individual results of one person, one individual, but aiming at a certain average level for the classroom or a minimum level for the classroom. Repetitive memorizing, you know that uh, memory is a lot to do with uh, painting uh, fine layers, but many of them uh, is difficult to do in a classical room, in a classical classroom. Once you have ICT, it becomes easy, because it's not one classroom, it's each to its own on the same content. And they can memorize, they can play the same game again and again and again. Auto socio evaluation, I won't go deeply into all these things, but you've met them. These are the recent trends in education. Serious games, of course, well, ICT are ideal for serious games. Everybody can play the game he wants, and he's got also, what comes later, uh, an immediate feedback. Immediate feedbacks are very, very fertile, but they're not very practical in a classical classroom. You, you give an interrogation or an assessment or whatever, it will take two, three, four days before you get the results. And it won't be delivered directly when your mind is hot on the topics and so on. No, you must remember why is it so and what does it mean? I just have a figure, I don't have, I don't have the explanation about my uh, mistake or whatever. So all these things, and I won't go through all of them, but you, you know them, are certainly possible through ICT and very difficult without ICT. So ICT can help new pedagogi pedagogical approaches and vice versa. If we can manage to blend them, discover the, the virtues of the end instead of the or, we've made lots of progress. So I'll now hand over to our speakers, and we'll start with Shiva. Shivananda Salgame comes from India. He is the director of a company named Guruji, and uh, he will introduce you to a very, very interesting uh, system whereby he can give different approaches to teachers. They can select. They don't have to be forced to using one approach. They've got many approaches, lots of content, and automatic evaluation of the whole system. So it's very flexible. You can be either very classical or very modern. It seems to be a very interesting source of inspiration. Thank you, Fisiva. Namaste, everybody. Uh, I have two responsibilities uh, which my uh, moderators and uh, hosts have given me this afternoon. One, to share a bit of our experience on what we have been doing with the teachers. And second is to keep you all awake. <laughs> so... I'm not too sure about the second one, but the first one, I should thank uh, all the presenters this morning who set a context in terms of how we can use technology more effectively in empowering the teachers and how effectively it can be used. So the first thing is another use of ICT in pedagogy. So it's very interesting, you know, the word pedagogy itself, you know, like... The word pedagogy, you know, as I understand, it's something where you have already decided what to teach the kid, and those steps which helps you teach the kids is already decided by the teacher or the facilitator. But what about andragogy? You know, where the teacher and the learner, both of them were not aware of what they were learning, and that's how the knowledge actually happened in this world. The entire development of the knowledge happened through that process. So let's go 
uh, further with the presentation. Uh, we are an edtech company, Guruji Learning Labs. We started off uh, uh, with an obsession to build technology which can empower and enable a teacher. So we started off way back in 2012, and currently we operate in our own 500 schools, 5,000 teachers, and close to 200,000 students. These are challenges which you and me already understand, and I just want you to reflect upon it so that uh, we are all on the same page. Yes, you know that uh, we have over 25.8 million teachers who need to be, you know, these numbers can keep changing, you know, it's a very dynamic situation. But these are as per the facts, and the low-income countries, there is significant amount, I come from the country where we have class sizes in excess of 40 to 60 per class, and the teacher has a huge challenge, apart from teaching, managing these kids. While at home, we know that one kid is actually a big challenge. We expect the teachers to manage in excess of 40 or 50 kids and still get the results out from them. Of course, uh, this is another thing which is very, uh, uh, you know, kind of scary for us. You know, if 75% of the teachers trained are not trained, you know, this is something which we also see in a country like India where most of the education, or more than 50% of the education is actually managed by the private authorities. So the, in the private, most of the teachers are not trained. That's a very scary situation. And last, and also the most difficult one is it's extremely difficult to recruit teachers. Profession of teaching is no longer fashionable. Every parent would want their child to get the best of education. But every parent, if you ask them, they're not too keen if their child would ever want to be made a teacher or encouraged to be a teacher. <clears throat> In 2012, uh, we decided, uh, you know, uh, later part of 2011, we decided to uh, learn through this field research. So we spent time visiting over 600 plus schools, right from the bottom of school to uh, the top international schools across the country of India. And this is what we learned. You know, these were some of our own insights. So improving quality of teaching is something which is so very crucial. And this became more important from the 21st century context because there were significant amount of educational reforms. So there were a lot of uh, changes in the curriculum across the world. There, every country started adopting, redefining the, uh, the way in which the education had to happen. And if you look at it, uh, the UNESCO, UNICEF, all of them came together to clearly say that it's not important on what you learn or teach, it becomes more important on how you learn or teach. The shift between what to how to was all about defining the 21st century education. So if that becomes important, then how do we actually build in the capacity in the teachers? Now, this is something which every school head was talking about. I just can't find Teachers, so finding teachers, training teachers, and retaining good teachers. This is, I'm sure, a global problem already, right? Now, training, as we understood, uh, we also realized that teaching is the only profession in the world which does not have on-job support. Every other profession, you can ask somebody to help you, but for a teacher in the classroom, there is absolutely no on-job support. So any training which happens would not last more than three weeks. When once they go, go back, you know, when once the teacher training is over and after three weeks, they get back to old habits because there is no continued support in most cases. This is another uh, important thing which UNESCO has continuously been talking about. There is no classroom-based evidence on what is working, what is not working. How do we build in 
those good practices which the teachers can cultivate on an ongoing basis based on evidence. And this is something which we also thought was very crucial for us as a part of our key learning during those uh, uh, field research activity. This is something which deeply influenced me and my co-founders. So if we teach today's student as we taught yesterday, we rob them of their tomorrow. This was a statement made in the early 20th century, and I'm sure this is more relevant today than ever. And I'm sure all of you would agree. So, so this is what happened at the start of 2012 when I went to some remote uh, village where we have been working even to this, this day, and I saw this kid getting anxious the moment I was holding a tablet. So, coming back to the role of technology for the 21st century classrooms, I just thought I'll share a bit of our story. <clears throat> As a part of visiting these 600 odd schools, we realized, and also uh, work, uh, discussing with various educational practices, practitioners from across the world, we realized that there was a whole lot of technology where edtech companies had developed this technology which could actually improve uh, the learning process. And unfortunately, if you look at it, most of what was available was actually in a self-learning mode, which means that most of the technology was primarily focused towards delivering content interestingly with a motivated learner in mind. If I and you were kids today, and if we ever had an opportunity to uh, sit in front of the computer, do you think we would have played Need for Speed or any such game, or would we have learned Newton's law of motion? I'm sure it's no brainer. Most of us would have loved to play in front of a computer. So unless you are focusing on a motivated learner, the current content is not applicable for anybody and everybody from a consuming point of view. Everybody was in a hurry to make the kids smarter, but we realized, what about the teacher? Right? Most of what was the technology which has been built over the last 10 years, I think it has already been mentioned, has not resulted in improving the learning outcomes of the child. And Primarily because whatever has been the technology which has come into the classroom, teachers have found it extremely difficult to adopt to it. While they have a responsibility of teaching, they also had a responsibility to learn technology which were not designed from a simplicity perspective. So they had to learn two new skills. One, how do I keep my classroom engaged, more interesting, and how do I learn this technology? So that is something which we said, these were some of what we realized, you know? The digital classroom plus inefficient teaching support or the teacher support led to low usage, low implementation fidelity, and low customer retention. When I talk about customer retention, it is about the users. The users no longer were too keen to use it if they had an option not to. Then the only other way which we could bring in efficiency was, yes, there is a need for a digital classroom, but there also needs to be somebody who acts as a mentor for the teacher while they are in the classroom. And we said that this is something which we need to focus on. If you look at it, what you teach in the classroom is what most of the teachers already know. But how you teach in the classroom is where there is a need for some help and assistance. Purely because we have diver, you know, diversified learners in the classroom, how do you facilitate diversified learners through meaningful engagement? So here we said that uh, we're gonna build a platform which would be an in-classroom companion for a teacher, and that would just be for the teachers. This technology is exclusively for the teachers, which would focus on the process and methodology of teaching, which would also confirm to the principles and practices. <clears throat> so
So the teacher knows what to teach, and these are the set of responsibilities for the teacher, while what most of the teachers would prefer is there is content and they would like to teach. We said that we are going to fill in the remaining part of the gaps through our platform. So let's see how we are going to do it. So con existing content can be con converted into meaningful adaptive teaching packs, which in turn will provide as an in-classroom guidance, which would help in improved learning. So 2012, we did the field research, got the insights. 2013, we were put on a global voyage by Unreasonable at Sea. Uh, you can look at it. It's, it's a very interesting program where 10 companies were selected for the voyage who were trying to solve the real problems. And then in 2014, we did our first set of implementation in 50 remote uh, schools. As a part of it, we said that if at all, if we are building technology, it has to conform to two things. One, it has to be implemented in a place where technology has never been used. Second, it has English and technology are not linked, which means it should be used in any language, in any place, in any conditions. Then in 2015, we expanded in five states and five, seven states in, with five Indian languages. And in 2016, we uh, redesigned the part, uh, product specifically for a mobile based on all the learnings which we had uh, gathered by then. And in 2017, we look forward to doing global pilots with various organizations. Now, uh, very quickly on the technology solutions, these are the four things which we said it's going to confirm to. It bridges the gap between what happens in teacher training and the actual in-classroom teaching. The app largely focuses on the process and methodology. It confirms to the existing teaching principles and practices and helps teacher learn new skills, customize their teaching methods in real time. And this is exactly what is very important for the teacher because there is a classroom with different ability learners, different style learners. How do you facilitate that? So if you look at uh, what the tool can do, it allows the teacher to have lesson plans in a very organized way. It allows multiple methods on the lesson plans. And so if you look at it, there is no one way of doing things. You know, there are multiple ways of doing the things. So you can have a teacher choose more than one method. We are not making the whole thing prescriptive. We allow the teacher to build the content or we allow the content creator to build the content in a way the teacher will have absolute freedom to decide in a way that they feel appropriate to use in the classroom. We are not telling the teacher what has to be done. We allow the teacher to make free choices. So they can easily manage the class, you know, uh, keep adding the classes, organize the classes and track the pr progress. And then you have an uh, interesting way of creating the lesson plans and then adaptive guidance and teach creatively. We have 27 possible methods the teacher can use to create the lesson plan and consume it in the classroom. And this is 27 possible methods which uh, are as it is taught in any teacher training colleges. So they have a wide variety of media elements which can be embedded as a part of the classroom. And all they need is just a smartphone. There is absolutely zero technology infrastructure which they need to have at the start of using this technology. And then obviously, you know, we have tried to gamify the entire process of uh, teacher training uh, as, a, as a part of uh, how the teacher can use it. Now, it automatically generates the logbook, which means that the teacher doesn't have to put any additional effort to create logbooks. Everything happens with absolutely no additional effort. That's what teachers love. And they have uh, a, quite a reflection on uh, how they taught, what they taught, when they taught. So it's a good reflection in terms of the progress. I always keep saying, you know, what would this world be without a mirror? So it gives a good reflection on how they have progressed. A feedback will help them improve on, on the time. So I have uh, my host uh, uh, mentioning about uh, the time I need to stick to. 
This is what happens as a dashboard for the principal as well. The principal will get to see the entire school, what has been happening, who is doing what at what time, and only focus on exceptions and not everybody, right? Wherever there are junior teachers, they need to be mentored, guided. Only those things are mentored. So effortless ways of managing the uh, school. The teacher, on an average, manages around 1,000 sessions in a year with absolutely no data which is currently being generated. And a principal can manage as many as 40,000 to 60,000 sessions in a year. We allow them to create this data. So I'm sure uh, you will get to see more of this uh, when you log into our uh, uh, website and also get to uh, download our app. So these are the logbooks which uh, the student also has access to whatever is the material which has been used by the teacher. So there is something called as the logbook for the student as to what was taught, when it was taught. And uh, all the digital content which was used by the teacher is available. The games and quizzes are also games, quizzes and assessment can be delivered to the student, which will clearly reflect on two things, learning Level, current learning levels and learning gaps. Based on the learning gaps, the remediation can be done by the teacher. So this is what it looks like. So this works completely without internet. This works on any Android device. It's multilingual and it is Zen based. Now we have a whole lot of adaptive uh, teaching algorithms which have been built on existing teaching theories. This is what it does for the teacher, saves time, saves effort, and makes everyday teaching fun and motivating. Uh, for the school leaders, saves time, saves effort in documentation, provides report and innovative practices, and then digital content uh, for the learners at home. So we are trying to close the complete academic loop. You know, this is what we've done as uh, current milestones. And uh, we are currently working with three uh, governments, you know, Pearson and Oxford University Press are two major global publishers we are already working with. And, uh, uh, you know, we've, these are some of our recognitions and rewards which we have won in different places. And Project Literacy Lab is something which is going to go uh, live uh, by the last week of this month in UK as a part of the Pearson initiative. And, uh, if I'm on time, thank you. Can you hear me? No? Yes, yes, yes. okay. The timing was not important at all, but uh, uh, it was fantastic to see how flexible your system is, how free uh, it leaves uh, the teacher. The teacher has no obligation to follow any path, he's got a choice of uh, approaches, of contents, and he's freed also of a lot of administrative work or management or education management work. As you've seen, all the results is uh, in the data, uh, all the evaluations, all the progress by all the individual pupils is there. You can go to flipped classrooms, you can go to whatever uh, new uh, strategies uh, we've seen, and, and it works very effectively, very lightly. Uh, thank you very much for such a beautiful system. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce, for those who don't know him yet, Papa Yuga Dieng. Je vais parler en français, parce que comme ça, il comprendra aussi. Euh, Papa Dugas vient du Sénégal, c'est une figure bien connue de la francophonie, c'est un, un, un bon soldat très militant pour la francophonie, il faut quand même que tous les pays qui parlent français soient aussi bons que les autres, et il y a beaucoup d'expérience qui vient compléter euh, peut-être la présentation de Madame Laroussi ce matin, Madame Laroussi venait plutôt du monde universitaire, ici tout ce qui intéresse l'école primaire et secondaire va être couvert plus spécifiquement par Papa Dugas Dieng, que je remercie. Merci. Donc, je vais avoir l'honneur de vous présenter 
les activités que nous menons dans le cadre de l'initiative pour la formation à distance des maîtres et en particulier l'expérience que nous développons au Sénégal qui s'appuie fortement sur les technologies. Je voudrais tout d'abord commencer par remercier les organisateurs de cet événement, y compris l'APF qui est un de nos partenaires principaux dans le cadre de cette initiative. Donc je ne reviendrai pas beaucoup sur le contexte puisque le besoin massif de formation d'enseignants, à la fois formation initiale que formation continue, a été signalé par le collègue qui vient de faire sa présentation. Donc je vais directement vous parler du FADEM. Et FADEM, c'est une initiative que la francophonie a développée pour accompagner les pays membres de la francophonie qui le désirent à travailler ensemble pour améliorer la qualité des enseignements et apprentissages par la formation des enseignants. Et euh, l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie et l'AUF ont été identifiés pour porter cette initiative et le mettre en œuvre euh, dans l'ensemble des continents. Je vais commencer tout d'abord par parler du contexte général de l'initiative, un peu ce que nous faisons à l'échelle de la francophonie pour finir par parler en détail de l'expérience au Sénégal. Donc la finalité, comme vous le savez, euh, appuie les pays à réaliser l'ODD4, et en particulier euh, la première cible qui fait référence à la qualité de l'éducation et à l'équité, et en particulier la cible 4C qui est le moyen à savoir générer un nombre important d'enseignants permettant d'assurer un enseignement de qualité. Et nous travaillons aussi en nous appuyant sur un dispositif de formation à distance hybride, un système qu'on appelle « blended learning » en anglais aussi, basé sur l'auto-formation, le tutorat et aussi des formations présentielles avec utilisation euh, des technologies et des ressources pédagogiques qui sont distribuées aux enseignants. Je vais y revenir tout à l'heure. L'initiative cible aussi prioritairement les zones rurales. Parce qu'on on le sait bien, il y a un besoin important d'enseignants, mais ce besoin est encore plus important quand on va dans les zones rurales. Et en général, dans certains pays africains en zone rurale, les enseignants n'ont même pas un seul document pour l'utiliser pour euh, faire leurs activités d'enseignement. L'initiative touche aujourd'hui 15 pays dans euh, l'ensemble des régions de l'Afrique, y compris Haïti et le Liban. Euh, pour avoir une idée de, de l'ampleur de ce que nous faisons, en général, nous commençons par former des enseignants sur la base d'une phase pilote qui regroupe une cohorte de 500 instituteurs, en général, sur un cursus de neuf mois. Après, nous évaluons la formation et nous travaillons avec les partenaires pour faire l'extension. En général, pour l'extension, nous travaillons sur 2000 enseignants puis 4 000, et aujourd'hui, nous avons une phase d'extension euh, en Côte d'Ivoire où nous formons 10 000 enseignants et 16 000 directeurs d'école sur un cursus de 9 mois que je vais vous détailler euh, tout à l'heure. Nous, notre action aussi est appuyée par un partenariat novateur, d'abord au niveau institutionnel, en interne, à la francophonie, où nous mobilisons euh, l'expertise de l'AUF et son réseau et aussi l'expertise de l'OIF et son réseau. On sait bien que l'AUF a une très grande expertise dans le domaine universitaire et, la, et au niveau de la recherche. Donc nous mobilisons les chercheurs du réseau de l'AUF et aussi nous mobilisons les acteurs du réseau de l'OIF au niveau euh, des ministères de l'éducation. En plus de, cet expert, de ce partenariat technique, nous avons d'autres partenaires techniques et financiers qui sont l'APF, Wallonie-Bruxelles International, le Québec, euh, l'ACDI, le Canada et l'AFD aussi, avec qui nous travaillons euh, dans certains pays. Les modalités de la formation. Je, donc, je, je vous le rappelle, nous, notre cible, c'est l'enseignant, c'est de donner à l'enseignant les compétences nécessaires à ce qu'il euh, délivre un enseignement de qualité. Donc, sur un cursus de 6 à 9 mois, sur la base de 200 heures de formation, nous avons différentes séquences. Donc, la formation commence en général par un regroupement 
de euh, trois jours euh, pendant lequel nous expliquons aux enseignants le fonctionnement de la formation, euh, nous les préparons à ce qu'ils puissent travailler à distance et nous leur donnons aussi les outils euh, de formation qui sont les livrets de formation, les autres documents nécessaires pour suivre la formation. Et c'est au moment du regroupement aussi que nous organisons les groupes. Maintenant, après le regroupement, l'enseignant va continuer à travailler sur la base de l'auto-formation en utilisant les ressources qui lui sont données, mais ils sont suivis par ce qu'on appelle un tuteur. Un tuteur encadre à peu près 20 enseignants. Et les tuteurs sont choisis parmi les membres du corps d'encadrement, c'est-à-dire ceux qui leur fonction naturelle est de suivre les enseignants et de les encadrer et de les aider. En fonction des pays, soit ce sont des inspecteurs ou bien ce sont des conseillers pédagogiques. Il y a des cas où nous avons deux regroupements. Maintenant, au deuxième regroupement, il s'agit de faire le bilan de la formation et d'introduire les nouveaux modules, ainsi de suite. Et à la fin, il y a l'évaluation des instituteurs. Dans certains pays, c'est une évaluation en cours de formation et une évaluation finale, qui a deux dimensions, une dimension pratique et une dimension euh, théorique. À la fin de la formation, euh, les enseignants sont certifiés et nous avons des taux de réussite supérieurs à 85% en moyenne. Et à chaque phase, nous évaluons le dispositif pour pouvoir définir la suite. Comment utilisons-nous les technologies C'est à l'échelle de l'initiative, à l'échelle des, des 15 pays membres. Nous avons opté pour un usage raisonné, puisque notre approche n'est pas technocentrée. Nous, notre but, c'est de développer les compétences des enseignants. Donc, chaque fois, nous nous posons la question à savoir quelle technologie est plus adaptée au contexte de l'enseignant que nous formons et qu'est-ce que la technologie lui apporte en général, nous mettons en place des espaces numériques. C'est le cas du, du Bénin, euh, Burundi et RDC, dans lesquels on donne aux enseignants les bases de l'informatique et les espaces sont connectés à Internet. Ce sont des salles informatiques connectées à Internet avec un formateur qui leur donne les bases et aussi qui les aide lorsqu'ils reviennent pour pouvoir accéder au contenu, aller sur Internet ou communiquer. Au Comores, et en Haïti, nous avons mis en place ce qu'on appelle des points numériques. Puisque nous avons appris des espaces numériques que ça ne marche pas, en général, ça ne marche pas bien. Ça, c'est une leçon que nous avons apprise. Ce sont des investissements lourds, mais au bout du compte, les espaces ne sont pas bien utilisés. Maintenant, euh, nous, nous travaillons sur un modèle d'espace plus réduit. Il y a moins de machines et plus proche des enseignants. Donc, ce sont des espaces avec 5 à 10 machines connectées sur Internet avec un moyen de connexion pas très cher comme dans le cas des espaces numériques et intégrés dans une structure de formation. Ce modèle-là de points numériques marche mieux en général que le modèle d'espace numérique. Sur IT, avec l'APF, nous allons expérimenter euh, à partir de la fin de cette année ce qu'on appelle le concept d'espace numérique mobile en exploitant un savoir-faire de l'APF, à savoir que l'APF a développé en Haïti des cuisines mobiles pour donner des cours de cuisine à l'intérieur du pays où l'accès à la formation est difficile. Donc nous allons utiliser cette même technologie pour développer des espaces numériques sur des camions qui pourraient se déplacer dans les zones rurales pour initier les enseignants euh, au numérique. Donc euh, il y a aussi... Euh, un renforcement de l'accompagnement par le mobile. C'est le cas du, de Madagascar où les tuteurs et les enseignants étaient dans une flotte avec un opérateur de téléphonie qui leur permettait de communiquer gratuitement et ils ont utilisé le mobile pour un peu le, le tutorat et aussi pour répondre à des questions courtes, à des questions à réponse courte, un peu pour évaluer le, leur progression dans les apprentissages. Au Sénégal, nous mettons en place le, euh, le modèle le plus avancé du point de vue technologique. Nous allons le, le voir tout à l'heure puisqu'il s'appuie sur des tablettes connectées à Internet. Pourquoi euh, au Sénégal nous sommes allés aussi loin C'est euh, les éléments qui sont liés au contexte. Donc nous avons un contexte politique favorable. 
l'engagement des autorités politiques. Nous avons un contexte technologique aussi favorable puisque il y a une forte pénétration du mobile, notamment en zone rurale. Ce n'est pas le mobile seulement en téléphonie, mais du mobile Internet avec du 3G et du 4G en milieu rural, dans toutes les zones qui nous concernaient. Donc, euh, nous n'avons pas eu de difficultés euh, avec un opérateur. Nous avons choisi de travailler avec tous les opérateurs et de demander à chaque enseignant de nous apporter une puce qui marche dans sa zone. De ce fait, euh, nous n'avons pas eu d'études à faire pour, pour déployer la solution que nous avons mise en place au Sénégal. Il y a aussi le contexte pédagogique. Il y a eu des structures qui ont une certaine expérience dans le domaine de la formation à distance, intégrant les technologies, qui ont une expérience de 10 ans, d'une dizaine d'années, sur le déploiement de plateformes de formation, avec des équipes aussi capables de développer du contenu multimédia à l'intérieur du ministère de l'Éducation. Donc, c'est des éléments comme ça qui nous ont facilité le choix du Sénégal. Maintenant, la phase du euh, pilote que nous avons développée au Sénégal, c'est une phase où nous euh, formons 500 instituteurs au centre du pays, c'est-à-dire dans les régions de Fatik et Kaolak. Il y a des enseignants qui sont de, dans des zones insulaires, d'autres en zone vraiment euh, en zone rurale. Voici la dotation pédagogique que nous avons remise à chacun des acteurs, les enseignants et les encadreurs. Chacun a reçu une tablette tactile 11 pouces avec une connexion Internet 3G, 4G, un jeu de 6 livrets de formation. Vous voyez deux exemples à côté. Euh, un dictionnaire, des logiciels éducatifs, euh, un accès en ligne sur un SPOC qui a été euh, hébergé par France Université Numérique sur une plateforme EDX, et aussi, il y a un compte Google Apps pour l'éducation que nous avons déployé pour soutenir euh, les activités. Donc, si vous le regardez bien, nous avons doté des enseignants de matériel pédagogique à la fois numérique et papier. Donc, les livrets, chaque enseignant a une version par papier et il y a euh, une version dans, euh, que je vais vous présenter là. Voilà. Donc, le, ce dispositif montre un peu... Euh, comment nous avons organisé euh, la formation des enseignants en fonction des outils. Donc nous avons euh, ici euh, l'enseignant équipé qui peut soit travailler en mode hors connexion ou en mode connexion. En mode hors connexion, il a accès au contenu embarqué dans sa tablette puisque nous avons embarqué sur la tablette euh, tous les livrets au format PDF, plus des logiciels éducatifs, plus d'autres contenus qui sont liés euh, au cours qu'ils suivent. Aussi, euh, l'enseignant en mode connecté sur Internet a deux possibilités. Soit il va sur la plateforme EDX, soit il va sur la plateforme EDX, et sur la plateforme EDX, il a le contenu médiatisé qui n'est pas du PDF, mais euh, du contenu avec euh, des vidéos, avec du son et de l'évaluation interactive pour l'auto-formation. Plus euh, tous les outils qui existent dans, dans EDX. L'autre choix qu'il a, c'est d'utiliser les outils Google Apps. De notre point de vue comme ça, ça paraît compliqué, mais dans la mise en œuvre, c'était assez simple. Puisque au niveau de l'enseignant, c'est transparent, c'est des outils en général qu'il utilise dans la vue courante. Puisque dans euh, le, le compte Google Apps, il a accès à la messagerie Gmail que tous utilisent. Donc la messagerie est utilisée pour la communication avec les tuteurs ou la communication entre eux ou la communication avec l'organisation. Il y a aussi Google Hangouts qui, qui a été un outil très utilisé pour le tutorat, pour la supervision pédagogique. Et avec cet outil-là, euh, nous avons eu une observation assez particulière au Sénégal que nous n'avons pas eue ailleurs. Puisque au Sénégal, avec Google Hangouts, nous avons pu parler en même temps avec tous les superviseurs de Paris, avec l'encadrement aussi qui est à Dakar en même temps. Donc le suivi pédagogique 
et vraiment, je veux dire, n'est pas hiérarchisé. On casse tout, toutes les hiérarchies que l'on connaît dans le suivi pédagogique. Tout est à plat. Et on peut parler avec n'importe quel acteur sur le terrain. Et n'importe quel acteur sur le terrain peut poser euh, son problème et avoir une réponse par rapport au problème posé assez rapidement et de façon plus concrète. Il y a le, le Google Drive où il y a beaucoup d'échanges en termes de fichiers, que ce soit des, du fichier texte. Ils ont fait beaucoup de photos, beaucoup de vidéos, puisque chacun a une tablette avec euh, deux caméras qui leur permettait de faire des films et de se passer les films. Un outil très intéressant aussi que nous avons utilisé, c'est Google Classroom. Comme je vous l'ai expliqué au départ, chaque euh, enseignant, chaque tuteur suit un groupe de 25 enseignants. Donc nous avons créé, créé des classes de 25 enseignants et leurs tuteurs dans Google Classroom. Et en même temps, les superviseurs des tuteurs étaient aussi des superviseurs de la classe. Ce qui veut dire que le tuteur, les enseignants et les superviseurs des tuteurs avaient accès à tous les échanges que les enseignants et le tuteur faisaient et aussi avaient accès aux évaluations et puis globalement à toutes les activités liées à l'apprentissage. Donc c'est un outil qui est très efficace puisqu'il fonctionne comme les réseaux sociaux. Et c'est un outil très simple et les enseignants s'en ont approprié assez facilement. Il y a aussi euh, l'outil Form que nous avons utilisé pour faire le suivi. En général, euh, lorsqu'on fait euh, le suivi de la mise en œuvre du FADEM, la remontée d'informations du terrain prenait beaucoup de temps, puisque les tuteurs devraient faire des rapports mensuels de tutorat, et ces rapports, ils les faisaient au papier, puis ils le transmettaient à le superviseur, qui par la suite le transmettait à une autre hiérarchie jusqu'à ce que arrive, ce que cela arrive au niveau de la capitale. Et après traitement, nous à Paris, nous le recevons pour avoir une idée de ce qui se passe dans la supervision pédagogique. Mais avec cet outil-là, je vais dire c'est instantané. Il y a un formulaire qui est mis en ligne chaque mois. Dans les deux jours, tous les tuteurs le remplissent et le formulaire est accessible par tout le monde. Donc là aussi. Les lenteurs hiérarchiques ont été vraiment euh, combattues et il y a eu des problèmes. Je vais y revenir un peu sur, sur la hiérarchie. Le dernier outil, c'est l'outil d'administration de, euh, de Google Apps qui nous a permis de gérer la flotte. Puisque avec cet outil-là, on, on peut définir les, les, les logiciels que l'on peut installer dans les plateformes automatiquement, dans les tablettes des instituteurs. Soit on les installe automatiquement ou on donne l'autorisation de l'installer. Mais ce qu'on autorise, ils ne peuvent pas installer, par exemple, un logiciel qui n'est pas autorisé. Cela nous permet de gérer pendant la formation euh, l'utilisation des tablettes. Et en même temps aussi, on a accès à des statistiques sur les usages pour voir quelle application est utilisée, quelle, ou, quelle autre application n'est pas utilisée, qui a des problèmes de connexion. Donc, ça permet de gérer la flotte. Et ces outils-là sont gratuits pour l'éducation. Donc, j'ai mis quelques apports euh, du numérique dont on a parlé. Déjà, j'ai parlé euh, de, euh, oui, de l'accompagnement de proximité. Parce qu'avec ces outils numériques, nous avons une meilleure socialisation de la formation. Parce que Bon, IFADEM repose beaucoup sur le terrain, sur la socialisation. Même là où on n'a pas beaucoup de numérique, on parle d'IFADEMIA, c'est-à-dire que les enseignants qui apprennent ensemble, qui sont organisés en groupe, qui se voient régulièrement, finalement, il y a une communauté qui naît. Mais avec le numérique, c est, c est, cette dimension-là a été accentuée. Et aussi, on sent l'engagement euh, des enseignants par rapport même à la qualité de leur formation et par rapport à la résolution des problèmes qui se sont posés. Donc, les, la, la prise en main des tablettes aussi a été très facile puisque nous pensons que c'est lié au fait que les tablettes sont très proches des téléphones, que euh, la prise en main a été assez facile. Les problèmes rencontrés, le premier problème, c'était les casses au niveau des tablettes. Il y a eu beaucoup d'écrans cassés. Et le nombre de tablettes cassées, c'est à peu près 10% qui a été assez élevé, lié au fait que nous avons pris 
euh, une tablette normale avec des spécifications qui ont été définies, mais pas sur la base de, de, de la robustesse des tablettes, mais sur la base de leur capacité technique. Et là, la leçon, c'est qu'il faut choisir vraiment des tablettes robustes, mettre l'accent sur la, la, la question du problème anti-choc et autres. C'est très important. Bon, il y a eu d'autres problèmes, oubli de mots de passe et autres. Mais la solution, c'est de, de mettre en place un système, un support technique robuste, très hiérarchisé et très proche des enseignants. Quel, il faut qu'ils aient toujours quelqu'un qui leur réponde dans leur s'ils ont un problème. S'ils n'ont pas de réponse, qu'ils puissent activer quelqu'un qui apporte des solutions. Bon, l'autre problème, c'était le problème de la hiérarchie, puisque avec la technologie, il n'y avait plus de hiérarchie. Tout le monde avait accès à tout, et ça n'arrangeait pas souvent certains responsables hiérarchiques. Donc, je terminais là, euh, sur les perspectives. Au niveau du Sénégal, il y a un accord qui a été signé avec l'APF pour euh, étendre l'initiative jusqu'en 2021. Bon, et aussi, le modèle de supervision pédagogique mis en place est un modèle que nous allons euh, déployer dans d'autres pays. Et il y a aussi l'aspect recherche, à savoir mettre en place des projets de recherche pour documenter euh, l'expérience du Sénégal. Donc, je vais terminer sur ces éléments. Je vous remercie. Bravo, Papa Yunga. Merci beaucoup. Je suis vraiment très, très reconnaissant, tant à Mouna qu'à Papa Yunga, de nous montrer ce qui se fait aussi en francophonie. Il faut aussi se rendre compte que, contrairement à la langue anglaise, la langue française, elle est essentiellement en Afrique. Le gros de la francophonie, elle n'est pas en Europe, elle est en Afrique. Voilà, voilà. Donc, c'est assez encourageant et rafraîchissant pour nous de voir ce que vous arrivez à faire en Afrique. Il faut dire que le contexte est différent. Nous avons tendance au nord à nous dire on a un système qui tourne, on n'a pas besoin de tout ça. Et vous avez, dans des circonstances parfois plus difficiles, avec moins de moyens, avec des contraintes physiques de climat, de distance et tout ça que nous n'avons pas, développé des systèmes auxquels on n'a on jamais pensé ici. J'ai particulièrement été impressionné par le euh, système du fair trade, toute l'éducation du fair trade et du bio en même temps. Euh, C'est fait euh, mine de rien, sans quasiment de budget, euh, il y a dix ans à peu près, euh, dans des pays tout à fait improbables. C'est vraiment une leçon. Ça tient peut-être aussi au fait que dans des pays où l'État est plus faible, la société civile a toujours été le support le plus important. Quand tout marche mal, ben, la famille elle continue à marcher. Et ça vous a permis peut-être de faire des choses dont on n'est pas toujours capable encore ici au Nord. Merci de nous rafraîchir à la mémoire et de nous montrer le chemin parfois aussi. Merci. Okay, now we're going to, in, uh, to see what Hendrin has to say. Hendrin is coming from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, school, uh, specific work. Thank you. Okay, Andrine. thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Hendrin Maat. I work at Edicons in the Netherlands. And I would um, informed us that there is a global learning crisis. So what do we mean by that? It seems that since the year 2000, more and more children are in school, but it seems that many of them are not learning sufficiently, let's say. They learn a little, but not enough. So if you see this picture, you can see many of them are sitting Day after day, they sit in a classroom, but what do they learn? And we do have a lot of data on school enrollment, on dropout, completion rate, but there is very little evidence about how students are actually learning. But what we know is that the teacher is rather important when it comes to the learning of the students. We also know that in many countries the pre-service teacher training is very much theoretical and not very much practice based. On the other hand, we know that teachers who are constantly learning and improving, we see also that the learning results of the students are, is going up. So when it comes to the learning outcomes of the students, 
We know, of course, it's not only the teacher that is important. The child is already born with a certain intelligence. The child has a socio-economic background. And then there is the teacher. There was a research a long time ago, in 1981, by Mr. Leven and Mr. Long, and they researched the influence of a teacher. What do you think? How many percent of the learning outcome depends on the teacher? 10%, 50%, 80%? 75, wow. You agree? Yeah. According to this research, it is 20%. 20. Maybe we feel a bit disappointed. Oh, is it only 20? On the other hand, if you believe the, the intelligence is already there. Of course, the socioeconomic background, it depends. So you can also say 20% is rather a lot. So knowing that students are learning little and that teachers are important, um, Educans and the University of Amsterdam, we came together in order to think uh, how to, to develop a teacher training method. A training method that is not focusing on the what, not on the curriculum and, and what the student has to learn, only focusing on the how. If this is your book, your mathematic book, this is what you have to teach, how do you do that? How can we move from a teacher center to a student center approach? So if you see these two pictures, what is the difference? Yeah, yeah. It's just a picture. This was, the, the first picture was taken before the project and the other picture during the project. Yeah, the seating arrangement, it's only one aspect. And there, there are many more aspects, but, but this is one of them that even by a simple picture you can already see some differences. The project was implemented in seven countries in uh, Africa and since last year we are also training in education in emergency settings, like Eritrean refugees in Syria and Syrian refugees in Lebanon. So we developed an ICT-based teacher training program, which is interactive, what means that you can select what you feel is applicable in your situation. There are 10 modules, um, teaching and learning, group work, learning styles, lesson planning. And all the modules, they start with an introduction, why is this important? Then there are some uh, video clips with questions to answer, some assignments and some literature. So, in, for example, if you work in a situation where there is no group work at all, you select group work. If the lesson planning is already perfect, you just skip the lesson planning. So you, you can use it as you, as you like. And another important aspect is that we always work with the teacher training colleges. And here a little bit of ICT comes in. We are not ICT experts. So what we do in order to to deliver our training, the first thing we do is to film a classroom. So, because we believe that if you want to change teaching practice, you have to start at the classroom level. A project then starts with filming a classroom. So you just sit in a corner of a classroom and you film the interaction between the teacher and the student without any interruption. And then the second step is to analyze the film with the teacher. So this is you. This is your lesson. What are you proud of? And the teacher can mention something. And is there also something that you think, maybe next time I can improve this or that? 
And usually the, the men from India already did speak about uh, youth classrooms. If, if there are 40, 50, 60 students in your classroom, then we try to observe how many of them are on task and how many are off task. On task, simply you observe by someone that is reading, someone raising a hand or whatever. And off task, you just look around or you talk to your neighbor, or you do something else. You're not actually learning, you are there. And then if, if we observe a lot of off task, we ask the teacher, what can we do to get more students on task? So this is our circle, our t training circle. And every six months, we start again with the monitoring. So it's monitoring, sharing, improving. And it's a very simple concept. Monitoring means you film a, a number of classrooms and you observe students and teachers. The sharing part, after two days after that, you analyze what you have seen together with the teachers and the teacher trainers. And you ask them, what do you want to improve? So the improving part is, that's the training part. So here, we, we train them on the how part. As I mentioned already, it's a cascade model. So the first two days of training, we train the teacher trainers and the government supervisors. And together with them is step two, we train the teachers. Here are some results. And we see if you work with the teachers uh, at the classroom level, we see that also the learning results of the students are going up. This is an example of, uh, of Ethiopia from 2011 to 2014. And we see that the 75 schools in the project, they improved. They started at, uh, what is it? 6.6 .6 or 6.7, I can't read it from here. And it, was, it increased until 7.7. .7. And the 30 other schools in the control group, they also they improved a little bit. So here we do have some evidence that if you work hard with the teachers after three or four years, you really can see that the learning result of the students is going up. We also we observed the professional level of the educators. And the University of Amsterdam developed for us an observation matrix with eight indicators for the teacher and eight for the student. And then we observe uh, each indicator um, has a scale from one to four. Is it weak? One. Is it moderate or average? It's two. Three is good and four is excellent. So here you can see the results of Lebanon of November 2016 and March 2017. And you can see the difference. So the difference after one training only. So first you will see what we observed last year in November. I'm sorry, there is no sound here. The lesson is in Arabic, but it doesn't matter. This is a mathematic teacher, secondary teacher, originally from Syria, and now she lives in uh, Lebanon. And this is the traditional way of teaching. You know, she is asking a questions, and all the students, they respond, all together. Now the same school, four months later. This is another teacher. 
And this is his introduction. Okay, I know it's very short, but did you observe any difference? I think the first, in the first classroom is more like mass answering. Everybody at the same time is shouting, yes, 15, 60, or whatever it is. And in this classroom, you see that they work more independently, more in smaller groups, and there are more students participating in the learning. So my final slide, there is also, uh, in addition to the three-year project, we also provide what we call train-the-trainer courses. And that's, this is, for example, Safety Children in Bangladesh. So we did train them also in how to design your own training. And we are using the same instruments, like how to use video, how to use an observation matrix. But this is more about... Um, how to, how to train a trainer, how to become a trainer. There is more information here. So if you are interested, you can take one of these leaflets. Thank you very much. Does it work? Yes. Thank you very much, Andrine. That was very interesting. It goes back sometimes to basics, which we should, we should not forget, of course, in ICT. Uh, just filming is an extremely good way to train a teacher. And also there's a difference between teaching and about training. Uh, training the trainers as well is an important uh, in, uh, ingredient. And uh, that shows a few things that are sometimes forgotten in purely ICT education systems. Thank you very much indeed. Now let's go to Yotander. Yotander works with uh, both the VUB University here in Brussels and is also with VVOB, which is uh, half of Educate. <laughs> and uh, it will tell us about uh, building up practices, building up capabilities in mainly Kenya. You know that Kenya is the number one country for running, but it's also getting to be one of the first uh, runners in education. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much. First of all, maybe do a small energizer because I'm afraid you're all falling asleep. So can I ask you to please stand up in case you are a policymaker? No policymakers in the room. Yeah, please stand up. For, stand up. Yeah, energizer. Okay, thank you. Professors, researchers in the room? Okay, some research. Yeah, yeah, more, more. Okay, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Thank you. Teachers? No teacher? Okay, thank you. Everybody's a teacher. ICT coordinators? Okay, no? Okay, thank you. I know more or less who you are. My name is Jo, or Jo in English as you want. And first of all, thank you, Marcin or Educate, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to talk to you about uh, a research I did in uh, Kenya, I think seven years ago. They invited me to, to go to Kenya, to Nairobi. And to think about the creation of a development of a professional development program to integrate ICT in Kenyan schools. And when I arrived in Kenya for the first time, one of the first things I remember is a, is a, a team member who mentioned, so please don't provide more technology without any support because this will happen. And I know you're all aware of this. So what we decided to do was to focus very much on capacity building in the schools and also, which was a, a big challenge in Kenya, was to bridge the gap between the, the macro level, the, the policy level, uh, the governmental level, so the attainment targets, the, the school level, um, 
actually the policy level at the school and the, the micro level, so what's happening in the classroom, so how to bridge that gap. Um, I, I wanted to focus with my research on the, the school level, and I came up with this framework, it's called For Imbalance, and maybe some of you know the game Tetris, how is it called, it's spelled in, in English, Tetris, yeah? Where you have to uh, have the bricks in one line, and actually the same should happen here. So what we want the schools to have is a clear vision about what is good education and how to use technology in order to realize your vision on what is good education. Because if you don't have a good vision, I mean, you can have nice uh, tools, nice infrastructure, but there will be no integrated way of technology. Um, but the same if you have nice infrastructure, nice content, without a vision or with us, without the expertise of the teachers, there will be no ICT integration at all. So actually we need these four in balance. And with our professional development program, we focused on collabor collaboration and support and strong leadership in order to realize this for imbalance model and ICT integration in teaching and learning processes, which was the aim of our program. So we came up with a lot of strategies in order to realize our goal. And maybe I just mentioned two of the, the, the most important strategies. The first one is that we decided to have an ICT integration team in each of the schools, which is a team of four to eight teachers responsible for the capacity of ICT integration in their schools. The second one um, is the, the implementation of teacher design teams, so, which is also a team of teachers, but we sat together with them to design or redesign their classroom activities and to, to think how can we make ICT rich environments out of it. A bit what you mentioned with your, uh, with your video, with your camera materials and to help them to improve their lessons. Um, also it's a longitudinal program so we started in 2011 and we ended in 2013. If you want to know more about the program itself you can read in a paper about the first study we did, not about the follow-up study. Uh, if you want to see this um, paper, you can uh, just Google my name, go to ResearchGate, or just send me an email. Or go, to the Educate or go to the Educate website, or maybe I can share it on Twitter as well, so we can use ICT for our own professional development here. Good. Uh, something about the four... Oh, we did a pilot in four schools um, near Nairobi. Um, there is more information about the schools in the paper as well, but what was important, there was no ICT before our implementation project, before the innovation project, but all of the four schools, they had electricity, which was important, of course, in order to implement ICT. So these are the four schools, and the main aim of my study was to figure out how the professional development program could support the schools in order to build capacity to integrate ICT in teaching and learning practices and focusing on the components of the foreign balance model, right? Um, I wanted to go for a longitudinal study, so we did a follow-up study two years after the program to see if it was sustainable and also I'd like to have a mixed method study, so to have both quantitative and qualitative measures, to have observations, focus group discussions, and so on. So some of the results. About the infrastructure, I was quite surprised to see that all of the four schools decided to have an, a PC lab, because they had to decide what they wanted. So what we provided was some money, it was 14,000 euro, so quite a bit of money, and they had to decide what to do with it, what kind of infrastructure they want, how to use it. But first, they had to come up with a plan, how they wanted to use it, what type of technologies they wanted, and actually, to be honest, that was a hard thing to do for them. Why? Well, if you're not experienced in using ICT, how can you come up with a policy plan? And how can you decide what to do with it? Something else? So apart from the computer lab, they also wanted laptops and projectors to use the ICT in the classrooms. But why the, the labs? It was related, I figured out in the focus group discussions and interview, to the fact that they wanted to secure their technology. So that was one of the main reasons. Another reason was the 
electricity they had in the computer labs and not in all the classrooms. But at the end, they, they mentioned that actually they wanted more laptops to have ICT near the teaching and the learning practices. Um, so that's one of the les lessons we've learned. So how are they using the technology? Mainly as a tool, as an information tool. So it's about the relationship between technology and information. It's, for instance, looking for information on the internet, presenting information, collaborating, and so on. So, but mostly the teacher is using the technology to present like I'm doing here for you, to show you some pictures, for instance, things you cannot show in Nairobi or in Kenya. What is an iceberg, for instance, that you can see here um, in a presentation. And also, maybe you cannot see it as a supportive tool for the teachers. And that was very important because maybe some of you went to the schools in Kenya or other places in, in Africa. When you look at the school books, they are not so up-to-date anymore. So for the teachers, it was really important to have access to technology to find uh, up-to-date current information, to prepare the lessons, to analyze, for instance, the results of their exams, uh, school management, and so on. So the use of ICT as a supportive tool, not really to improve teaching and learning in the classroom. Some of the quantitative data, what you see here is that there is a gap between their actual use and the preferred use, uh, but when you look at, a, at it from a positive point, is that actually they acknowledge the use of ICT and they wanted to use it more often. Crucial in our project was leadership. We saw in a follow-up study that three of the four schools are still moving on with new technologies and that's because of strong leadership. And this leader, these school leaders, they are helping actually the ICT integration team, reinforcing the ICT integration team. When new teachers are coming, the ICT integration team is training the new teachers, for instance, and that's capacity building. In one of the schools, ICT is disappearing at the moment because of a lack of ICT integration team, because of no supportive leadership. So, schools are also developing policies, and one of the nice things I found out in the follow-up study is that these schools are actually training other schools because one of our concerns was, okay, we did a nice pilot in four schools, put a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of money in it, but what about the scalability? And now we see that other schools are coming to these schools to, to be trained. So that's a nice thing already, but still the question is how to implement such a vision, such a training, large scale. Um, we also see the policies now, but no policy plan. So I have no documentation, no plans, and I'm wondering, is that a problem? Should it be written down or not? Uh, that's also a problem in, uh, in Flanders, by the way. Another question is, the teachers are still doing what they were doing before. So they are not transforming their education, they are not integrating 21st century skills, for instance. The question is, is that a problem? It's a very centralized system. We see that they are teaching to the test, there are national tests. And the question is also how to do that, how to get the students use new technologies, and I think there your program maybe can help these teachers to implement these 21st century skills. And my last question is maybe, okay, how then to set up a professional development program in order to integrate 21st century skills in a country, centralized country like Kenya with national tests, with a very top-down policy making? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yo. That was fantastic. It's uh, very concrete, comes from the field. Interesting to see that you managed also to blend uh, poor schools and uh, less or more privileged schools. And it's interesting to see that the same approach can be applied in different environments uh, with different uh, results sometimes, but uh, at least you didn't con concentrate just on either the underprivileged or with the privileged, and that was also very interesting. Okay, wonderful speakers, they managed to keep on time and to deliver most of, I think, what they had to deliver. We didn't feel they were running sometimes for time, they did it very well. So we've got plenty of time to go more interactive and to go to questions. We have 25 minutes.
Okay, which is good. Thank you, speakers. Who will start? We'll get the ball rolling. Yes, maybe the speaker should come back to the, to the table here, if you don't mind. Biscuits are not for you. Huh? There's one box for it, each of them. There we are. So, questions? Wow, that's too many. Okay. Burundi first. Merci. Je voulais poser une question à Papa Yunga Dien. J'ai vu dans votre exposition que vous êtes un peu partout, enfin, dans pas mal de pays en Afrique. Euh, je voulais vous demander euh, ce que ça représente votre infrastructure parce que le problème qu'on a justement c'est le matériel dans ce que vous avez expliqué vous avez des points de, de connexion des centres de, enfin, où les enseignants ils peuvent accéder euh, qu'est-ce qu que ça représente au niveau de, de l'infrastructure du matériel que vous pouvez mettre à disposition de, de ces enseignants là euh, une autre question vous travaillez avec des des organisations privées, des ONG ou euh, de l'administration Comment c'est organisé Parce que je pense que c'est très important pour beaucoup de pays en Afrique. Merci. On dit ça dans le même sens que madame. Et c'est monsieur Papa que je m'adresse. Vous avez souligné le rôle favorable de l'État. Je voudrais savoir exactement ce que ça signifie. Est-ce que l'État collabore dans le financement ou euh, facilite tout simplement votre entrée dans les écoles, réorganise les écoles à cause de votre arrivée, etc. Merci. Merci. Et tout le monde, pour le question. Je suis le représentant de l'Éducation internationale de Belgique. Nous avons un projet dans le sud-est de Bangladesh. Nous avons commencé la school, la primaire school. And we give also scholarship for girls, uh, for orphan girls. No, we, I am uh, originally from the teacher training. And so we must train our own teachers in the school. So what you explain, the difference uh, in the, the example of Lebanon. We also have the same experience. But we also train in in group work, uh, different uh, classroom techniques and so on. But what we stated was, when we, after six months or eight months come back, they use the new techniques. So they, they, they reproduce what they did before. Uh, parotic systems and all sorts of things. Uh, only using the textbook and so on. But we learn different new techniques for the exploration of the environment. And there uh, are very fantastic results, but uh, the, the pressure of the environment, uh, the traditional, we are very, very strong. And so we need to come back uh, regularly to, to the activity system. The same also with uh, an ECT techniques. Uh, we start computers. Now we install a whiteboard in the world, but we must be very activated that they will use it frequently and integrate in the, in the uh, uh, school practice. But we see also teachers are interested in it. They want to use it, they want to learn it, but after the seminar they follow. Thank you. Another question here? Ladies first. I think uh, it's interesting if it, you could go on, Sashiananda, about this multilingual aspect. Because very often the use of ICT is linked to the use of English. And I think it is extremely interesting to keep tribal languages, uh, original languages, a lot of languages are being lost. So I think this multilingual aspect, also the connection with you know, the own culture and so on is stronger, of course, if you can use ICT in your own language. Thank you. 
Shall we take maybe a last question for this uh, wave here? Thank you. Michel de la Revue d'Africain. Je voulais juste demander à Monsieur Papa euh, Yoga, oui, s'il y a eu une évaluation comparative pour savoir si en utilisant justement les technologies de l'information, on atteignait plus rapidement les objectifs pédagogiques. Ça serait très intéressant parce que moi, personnellement, je dis, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un effet de mode par hasard qu'on dise on va utiliser les technologies de l'information parce que justement tout le monde en parle ou est-ce que c'est beaucoup plus efficace pour pouvoir atteindre les objectifs pédagogiques Je suis pédagogue moi-même, donc euh, c'est à ce niveau que je pose la question. Merci, monsieur. Maybe we'll start with this wave. <laughs> And we've got ample time for another one afterwards. Do the mic work. Try. Does it work? Yes. yes. It works. Yeah, I can, I can be the first one. Okay. So I will answer, try to answer your question. Um, after a training, if you come back after six months, is, is there any change? And I did not mention it in my presentation, but in each country, we work always through a local organization. And that organization, usually it's an NGO, but it can also be a teacher training college, they have to follow up in between Uh, the first and the second training, or the second and the third training. Because I, I, uh, I agree with you, if there is no follow-up, then it was a nice training, but you know, six months later everybody has forgotten. So it's very important for the local organization to, to continue to visit these schools, to continue to, to film and to observe and to reflect on the teacher's behavior. On the other hand, what I have seen here in, in Lebanon, for example, teachers are so proud of what they are doing that they are even filming themselves with their, their um, uh, mobile. And then next time if you come back, then they will tell you, hey, can I show you what I have done? So I think it's also a lesson for us that there are always some teachers that are really picking up it very easily And you can use them as a kind of role model and show them in the next training, look at him or look at her, what he can do. And then maybe the others might think, oh, I can do that myself, no? So you, you really need to find out the good ones in order to present them as an example. Which is also an answer to this gentleman's question as well. Maybe the fashionable aspects can be handy as well. Sometimes it can help go viral with good tendencies. Okay, other answers to other questions? Oui, donc je vais, je vais répondre à, aux trois questions qui m'ont été posées directement. Euh, les deux se ressemblent, c'est en fait le rôle de l'État et la place du, de l'État sur la mise en œuvre de l'initiative. Euh, L'OIF est une organisation intergouvernementale, donc les pays dans lesquels nous travaillons sont membres de l'organisation. Et nous, nous les appuyons à mettre en œuvre. Nous n'avons pas le mode de fonctionnement d'un projet. Nous travaillons avec la structure nationale qui est chargée de la formation continue des enseignants. Et avec cette structure, nous l'appuyons à mettre en place les organes de gouvernance basés sur les organes nationaux. Par exemple, il y a un comité national présidé par le ministre Ensuite, il y a un secrétariat exécutif, c'est l'organe opérationnel de l'initiative qui est dirigé en général par le directeur de la formation. Et c'est des structures comme ça jusqu'au niveau local. Et les membres de la structure sont des fonctionnaires qui ne sont pas payés par l'initiative, mais qui font le travail. Par exemple, pour l'encadrement des enseignants, ce sont les inspecteurs ou les conseillers pédagogiques dont le rôle naturel est de les encadrer. Nous, notre action c'est de renforcer les compétences de ces acteurs en les appuyant, en mobilisant l'expertise internationale francophone pour organiser des formations de renforcement des compétences dans les domaines dans lesquels ils interviennent dans l'initiative. De ce fait, à la fin d'une phase, on a tous les éléments au niveau du ministère qui peuvent après développer. C'est pourquoi en général, il y a une seconde phase et même une troisième phase. Donc pour la gouvernance. Et nous n'avons pas d'équipe 
comment dire, ce projet au niveau de, du pays. Le maximum que nous avons, c'est au niveau du campus numérique. L'AUF qui est membre de l'initiative, nous mettons en place deux ou une personne pour appuyer le ministère à mettre en œuvre. Ça, le, le, modèle, le modèle de mise en œuvre. Maintenant, sur le plan technologique, nous appuyons les structures de formation à mettre en place en leur sein des espaces numériques. C'est-à-dire que l'initiative ne détient pas euh, la technologie. Ou bien, nous mettons en place un partenariat qui permet de compenser un manque que le pays ne peut pas satisfaire. Par exemple, lorsque nous, euh, pour le Sénégal, où nous avons un spot, il fallait déployer une plateforme EDX avec une excellente connectivité. Il y avait une structure qui avait les capacités technologiques, mais elle était tellement chargée que euh, les réponses étaient lentes. C'est l'agence de l'informatique de l'État qui a un, un data center et tout, mais l'équipe était tellement restreinte qu'on ne pouvait pas travailler en temps euh, euh, voulu. Donc c'est pourquoi nous avons fait un accord avec France Université Numérique pour héberger la plateforme. Voilà. Maintenant, sur l'équipement, euh, dans certains cas, nous équipons les instituteurs eux-mêmes, comme pour le Sénégal, où nous leur avons donné des tableaux. Mais pour d'autres pays, c'est le papier qui fonctionne. Parce que si on va au fin fond du Canada pour former l'enseignant là qui est à 500 km de Colombie, qui n'a jamais vu son ministre, qui ne pourrait pas le reconnaître dans la rue, pour le former, il faut lui donner du papier. Ouais. Et puis plus, si on veut faire du numérique, on peut faire de l'audio. Hein? Ou bien on peut utiliser son téléphone portable. C'est pourquoi nous, nous disons que euh, nous avons un usage raisonné des technologies. Nous utilisons euh, le meilleur choix technologique en fonction du contexte. Voilà, je crois. C'est intéressant effectivement de voir que vous avez les avantages et les inconvénients d'être très intégré à l'État. Vous avez l'avantage, vous êtes tout de suite opérationnel partout quand l'État le veut. Mais par contre, si l'État ne le veut pas, c'est plus compliqué. Mais par contre, c'est plus, plus fort que pas mal d'ONG parce que vous avez l'État avec vous. Oui, c'est qu'on ne le fait que quand l'État le demande. Oui. Parce que si, si nous, euh, nous faisons une fois dans un pays, c'est parce que l'État l'a demandé. Mais État qui, les États qui ne le demandent pas, on, le, on ne le propose même pas. Ouais. Shiva, there are some questions for you. Uh, on the green one. There were uh, a question on the multilingual aspect of it, and uh, I also would like to take the teacher training part of it, which he mentioned. Uh, uh, the first is the teacher training part of it, and I think this is uh, one of the global challenges which most of the teacher trainers, are, teacher trainers, teacher training organizations and the government are facing. Any training which is not contextual and at that point in time, my ability to adopt and implement the same is always a challenge. When a teacher comes to a teacher training uh, workshop, the you know, the trainers are charmers. They charm them, they, you know, there are a lot of skills in which they actually teach them how to uh, use the same technique in the classroom. But it's like the great actors, right? Now, when I go back, I cannot enact in the same way, in the way in which I have been trained. So my context is not understood by the trainer many a times, because it's very difficult for the trainer to understand all the context. Now what happens is, if I want to, you know, what we are trying to do is, teacher training workshop is important, but there has to be some kind of a continuity for the teacher when they get into the classroom. So if there is a possibility of embedding this context-based training videos, audios, set of instructions, you know, through apps or there are several ways which we are trying to experiment with, then what happens is the teacher can relate to the context-based training which would be available for them, which would be a kind of a support system for the workshops which they have attended. Specific to the multilingual aspect of it, you know, I think we believe that uh, if at all if uh, democratization of education has to happen, then it the technology should allow the non-English uh, speaking uh, 
community to have access to and I come from a country like India where there are multiple languages. We started off working in extreme uh, remote forest locations and uh, uh, there were quite a few schools where the students never came to school because the language of instruction though was a regional language, the te none of the students ever understood that language because they were speaking tribal language. So we spent time with an NGO to build a picture dictionary, uh, you know, with the local language, the tribal language and a picture, which started helping the teacher and the student to start communicating with, between them more meaningfully. And uh, today if you look at it, at, uh, the school starts at 10 and by 9.45 the kids are already standing in front of the school. So there is, the teacher said that it improved the attendance in a very big way. So we believe that there has to be a lot of cultural advantages to be brought in by the technology, which brings in effectiveness. You know, this world is as complex as we can imagine, and we need to find solutions which can have as many possible ways of implementing the technology in an effective way for education because the education is the only way this world can be better and we need to do our bit in as much a small way. One of the things which we understood uh, as a part of our uh, Guruji uh, program is there were two things which we wanted to validate. Implement our technology in a place where technology has never been used and ensure that it works in any place, in any condition, in, by anybody. And our app, you know, uh, coming specifically, today we don't take more than 10 minutes of training for a teacher to use it. The teacher, I have trained over 10,000 teachers in the last uh, uh, six months, uh, conducting workshops in both pre-service and in-service teachers. And one thing which is very clear is, there is a clear message by the teacher, I want to use it and I think I can use it. And that itself is a great uh, belief that teachers today need help and if we can make them smarter, it only makes the world better. I think that we've answered the first uh, way we have questions. Anything to add to those uh, answers? You? Maybe uh, something you mentioned is, is very important. It's not only changing behavior, but also changing the pedagogical beliefs of the teachers. And that's something very hard to do because what we see in our research is that the pedagogical beliefs you have are strongly related to your behavior in the classroom. And what we can do with our interventions is to change the behavior, but maybe in a short term to change the beliefs. So, for instance, look at us here. We all have a specific belief of what is a conference. And that's exactly what we are doing here. So it's very hard to change that belief of should a conference be always like this, we sitting here, you sitting there, listening and questions and questions. So it's very hard to change beliefs of teachers, of our own beliefs. And that's a big challenge, I think, for... Uh, I'll just add to it. You know, one of the things uh, which we all have to, which we all know, which we all have to understand is practice makes us perfect. And that is a problem for a teacher because a teacher over a period of time would have perfected an art of delivering the session in a particular way, but the learners are continuously changing on an ongoing basis. So the learning styles are very different. So how do I change when the learner's expectation of learning could be very different? So differentiated instruction is very, very vital for a dynamic classroom and more specifically from a 21st century perspective. So how do you facilitate differentiated instruction would not come by if you do not provide the right kind of contextual support for the teacher to adopt to something very different from what they're already used. <laughs> par rapport à la question de la durabilité des résultats de la formation qui a été posée. Bon, ce n'est pas vraiment exactement une réponse, mais euh, dans la formation, si on se limite à former seulement l'instituteur, nous avons des chances qu'après il va retrouver son confort. Mais si on forme l'instituteur et celui qui le supervise au moins, et qu'on arrive à les convaincre 
sous de nouvelles méthodologies, on a plus de chances de, de voir ce qu'on a installé de façon durable. Comme dans les pays où il y a des inspecteurs, par exemple, qui doivent superviser les enseignants. Il serait bien de les former aussi aux nouvelles méthodes pour que eux, dans la supervision des enseignants, qu'ils puissent faire le suivi de la formation. C'est ce que je voulais ajouter. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Indeed, Marcia just told us that we need to stop at uh, 10 to 4. So, uh, as a conclusion, maybe, I will have one question for all of you. I would like you to give me the top success factor and the top failure factor, according to you. Quel est votre, selon vous, le plus grand facteur de succès et le plus grand facteur d'échec? Donc, c'est à quoi nous devons faire plus attention, négativement comme positivement. Okay, the success factor uh, for any uh, implementation is in our ability to build solutions which is solving a real big problem and which does take the teacher or the user through minimum behavioral change. The behavioral change is very, very crucial for the success. Anything which motivates the behavioral change will be the success part of it. Second is anything which we build has to be acceptable, adoptable, affordable and scalable. If it is not so, then it's bound to fail. Thank you. Papa Papa Yunga. Moi je pense que l'un des facteurs de réussite les plus importants, c'est le portage de l'initiative par les acteurs locaux. Que les acteurs locaux soient au centre des activités et que chaque acteur local soit renforcé pour qu'il fasse au mieux son travail. C'est l'appropriation pour moi qui est au cœur de la réussite pour garantir une durabilité. Et comme écueil à éviter, l'écueil majeur L'écueil majeur, c'est de faire à côté du système. Ça veut dire de venir greffer quelque chose sur le système. Mais même si ça fonctionne très bien, après votre action, Merci par Yunga. Andrew. Okay, I believe the top success, if you come back after six months or after a year or, or whatever, and you see that the teachers enjoy their job better than before, then I think, wow, this is a big success. If you see them, that they are smiling, that they want to show you what they have done, the materials that they made, and also the students. I think if students and teachers enjoy better yeah, teaching and learning, then I think that's the biggest success so you can get. So as a get. success factor, yeah. you could aim at the well-being of a teacher, yeah. making them yeah. happier. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and the failure then, of course, is uh, what we also face is the, in some countries, a high turnover of teachers. You train them, and then I don't know what's happening, but then it seems the better you become, the more interested other people also are in you, and then you have to start all over again. But so I don't know what to do about it. Maybe train more than you need. <laughs> also, or also make us teaching the best job in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yes. But it's Yo. something that we all have to work on. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. Yo? I think the main finding of the, the study I present is uh, that teachers start collaborating. So collaboration is on number one, like co-creation, teacher design teams, team-based work, school-based work, um, team teaching, it's very important. Number two is good education should be the starting point of the technology. And number three is um, that I think we need good leadership to implement this vision. One of the pitfalls is, uh, yeah, can be assessment that we are teaching to the tests. To the tests, I mean, that we don't look at 21st century skills because we need this content to be delivered because of the tests. That's uh, something to, a pitfall to avoid indeed. Thank you very much for making me my best conclusion. Done much better by you than by me. And uh, I think we are spot on time. Thank you very much for your assistance. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you for your participation. And uh, we've got uh, most of the presentations, I think, on the side. We'll have also the VOD. Thank you to Kathleen and to uh, Carlos. 
Uh, it's a first. Thank you very much. I think it was uh, sometimes a bit difficult, but you, you made it. Thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to seeing you again, uh, maybe before next, the next conference next year, in some projects. Good luck in all your projects. Thank you. Thank you.